Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Shepard, and I'm the U.S. Product Manager for Erectile Restoration at Boston Scientific. On behalf of Dr. Levine and everyone at Boston Scientific, I would like to welcome our global audience to tonight's webinar, Treating ED with the AMS 700 CX Penile Prosthesis in Men with Peyronie's Disease. I'm excited to have Dr. Levine with us today for this webinar as he is a nationally and internationally recognized authority in the treatment of erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease. Dr. Levine is a professor in the Department of Urology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. He was trained at the Harvard Program of Urology Brigham and Women's Hospital and was previously a faculty member and clinician at the University of Chicago before joining the Department of Urology at Rush Medical Center. He has many national and international academic contributions, including 220 published articles and 45 book chapters. Special honors include being a past president of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America and the Chicago Urological Society. In 2015, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Sexual Medicine Society of North America for his contributions to the field. During this webinar, Dr. Levine will present a comprehensive review of treating drug refractory ED in patients with Peyronie's disease. Following his presentation, we will have time for a live Q&A, so please take advantage of the chat and Q&A features throughout the webinar. All right, now I'll pass it over to Dr. Levine, can take it away. Thank you, Allison. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Boston Scientific for uh, putting this together. This is uh, certainly a subject which is uh, near and uh, dear uh, to uh, my heart uh, and uh, something which um, uh, we're lucky to have a lot of experience with um, in Chicago and therefore I'm delighted to be able to do this uh, webinar which uh, hopefully will be enduring and uh, can be um, uh, visited and reviewed uh, again and at another time if people uh, can't uh, attend tonight's uh, uh, webinar. So, um, Without further ado, let's get uh, to the task at hand. We're going to talk about treating erectile dysfunction with the uh, CX700 prosthesis in men with uh, Peyronie's disease. Um, we do have some uh, introductory information here. Of course, uh, uh, this obligatory stuff. Uh, uh, the materials here are intended to describe common clinical considerations and procedur procedural steps for the use of reference technologies, but may not be appropriate for every patient or case. Certainly decisions surrounding patient care depend upon the physician's personal and professional uh, judgment in consideration of all available information for the individual case. And Boston Scientific does not promote or encourage the use of its devices outside their approved labeling. Case studies are not necessarily representative of clinical outcomes in all cases as individual results may vary. So we'll start with some caveats. First of all, uh, Peyronie's is both a physically and psychologically devastating disorder. And this is an important thing, I think, for all of us to recognize when we meet uh, these patients uh, with uh, Peyronie's disease. They are uh, emotionally uh, distraught. Uh, it is also not uh, a rare disorder. Uh, demographic studies have suggested probably upwards of 10% of men can be affected, and certain populations are maybe more affected. For instance, men after radical prostatectomy uh, and diabetic men may have as a group uh, a higher uh, prevalence of uh, this disorder. Uh, it does not tend to resolve as uh, previously uh, 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 resolve spontaneously uh, as previously uh, thought. In fact, in my opinion, based upon the pathophysiology that we understand, if there is resolution, it's probably uh, because it wasn't Peyronie's disease in the first place. There was probably some form of uh, delayed wound healing, a scarring process that just simply went away. Uh, but uh, if patients do present to you uh, in the acute phase, it's been shown that upwards of 50% of patients will get worse and about 40% of them will stay the same. There is no non-surgical uh, no non cure for Peyronie's disease at this point, but uh, various non-surgical treatments can stabilize and possibly even reduce deformity and improve function. And if we are going to take uh, a non-surgical approach, uh, we should realize that uh, treatment-related change occurs at glacial speed, very slow. SCAR does not move fast. 
Surgery uh, it, to me is uh, the most rapid and uh, reliable uh, treatment. And therefore to me, it's the gold standard. Uh, diagnosis uh, is easy, uh, but uh, treatment does remain a challenge. So the current uh, paradigm for understanding the pathogenesis of this disorder is uh, still uh, in flux, but I think this at this time makes good sense. This is how I explain it to the patients, that it is a wound healing disorder uh, occurring presumably in a genetically susceptible individual whose tunica albuginea responds inappropriately to an inciting event. And that inciting um, event is trauma. Uh, which may be the most minor of trauma, but that will activate a proliferative fibrotic reaction within the tunica albuginea, resulting in an exuberant inelastic scar. And these last four words are probably the most important as to uh, why Peyronie's uh, is Peyronie's, and that is because the scar tissue does not resolve as would normally happen in, uh, in a normal wound healing process. Scar builds up, and then it undergoes the last phase of wound healing called remodeling. Remodeling seems to be blocked in patients with Peyronie's disease, resulting in that persistent uh, scar and, def and subsequent deformity. Now we know Peyronie's disease is associated with curvature. This is sort of a hallmark, but I think we're beginning to recognize now that indentation deformities of various sorts are not atypical. In fact, they're pretty common in our own experience, and we're doing a, a review of our own um, uh, experience at, at Rush Hospital over the last five, six years is probably about 70% of men have some degree of indentation deformity uh, and maybe only indentation deformity without a curvature. Length loss is common uh, and devastating. Uh, we've done surveys and found that of all the things that happen to men with Peyronie's disease in terms of curvature, indentation, ED, and so on and so forth, length loss seems to be the most devastating to them. And it's frequently uh, associated with erectile dysfunction. Uh, studies have shown that 8% of men with ED will also have Peyronie's disease. I think it kind of depends on how those studies are done. So it may be even higher than that. But upwards of 75% of men with Peyronie's disease uh, will have concomitant uh, erectile dysfunction. Now, this may be due to uh, underlying you know, vascular uh, disease that may have been pre-existing, such as due to diabetes, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, and smoking. But it may also be that the plaque itself uh, interferes with the veno-occlusive mechanism. So we have venous leak and we can't maintain rigidity. And of course, as I said before, uh, this process is emotionally devastating to patients. Uh, and this can result in various um, interference and inhibition of arousal uh, and maybe contributes to erectile dysfunction as well. How do we evaluate Peyronie's disease? Well, we always start with history. We want to know the time of onset uh, because that will give us a clue as to whether we're in the acute uh, or uh, uh, so-called chronic phase. Um, <clears throat> we want to see if there's any recognized association with trauma. In my own experience, uh, probably no more than 20 or 30% will actually recall a specific event where they injured their penis. Uh, I tell them that it may be something that uh, during intercourse, uh, you know, he went one way and partner went the other way, and that put excessive pressures on the penis, <clears throat> resulting in uh, a microfracture that triggers this uh, abnormal wound healing process. Pain is certainly something we see more common uh, in the early phase, and we want to know if there is existing pain, uh, and then uh, ask them to estimate their own curve. Uh, frequently, uh, they're wrong, but it's useful to, I think, uh, get an idea of what they think their deformity is. And then get estimated length loss. And I've heard up to four inches many times in men. I'm not sure if that's quite true, but I hear it a lot. I also asked them to um, give me a, uh, a report on what they uh, estimate their own erection hardness on a zero to 10 scale, where zero is uh, no erection, 10 is a so-called diamond cutter. Uh, and a seven uh, would be an erection, <clears throat> which would be called stuffable. And men appear to understand this type of uh, concept. We want to know what is their capability of having penetrative sex. I've had men, many with curvatures of 60 to 70 degrees, mostly dorsally, and they're able to have penetrative sex with no problem. And you ask their partner and nope, doesn't bother me either. So it, a lot of it uh, may be just being bothered looking at it, but they still can be functional. But we want to know if they're inability to have sexual activity 
or they're compromised to have sexual activity, uh, is it due to the deformity uh, and or uh, rigidity issues? And then finally, we want to know about risk factors for erectile dysfunction. As I mentioned before, I call them the erection busters, diabetes, hypertension, elevated cholesterol, and smoking. <clears throat> Examination is the next step on the evaluation ladder. We want to uh, evaluate the penis on stretch because this will amplify the palpation of the scar. Uh, frequently, you'll have a patient, they have a readily palpable scar by doing this, but they can't feel it at all because they're feeling it in the sort of um, flaccid condition. But if you put it on stretch, uh, this will uh, amplify that. We want to measure at the initial presentation, and frankly, I do it at every presentation uh, following that initial time, the stretch penile length, because that can change just with time with these patients. And of course, potentially our therapy will do it. So we want to document uh, what we have to, in the beginning, and I'll show some pictures of how to do that in a moment. Duplex ultrasound is performed to assess for calcification. Up to 32% will have some degree of calcification, maybe a little stippled calcification to a full-on <clears throat> chunks of bone. We want to measure pre and post injection cavernosal uh, artery diameter and assess uh, uh, flow parameters as well, peak systolic and diastolic velocity and resistance index. Probably most importantly, we want to measure curvature with a goniometer, and then I use a string with a ruler to uh, measure girth discrepancies, uh, particularly in uh, areas of indentation deformity. <clears throat> and then finally, we want to assess erectile response that they get to the injected drug during this ultrasound study as compared to their home erection. We want them to get as hard as they would at home or better uh, because this will give us some indication as to the quality of the erection that they're uh, obtaining. I've had men say, oh, I get an eight out of 10, and then they'll have a clearly a six out of 10 uh, poor quality erection. And they'll say, yeah, that's similar to what I have at home. And I think that's going to direct our uh, type of therapy differently, depending upon what we discover as far as their erectile capacity. I apologize. I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat here today. So if I... Uh, get a little coffee and so forth, just uh, uh, forgive me. <clears throat> so we, here's a picture of, of uh, examining the penis on stretch. You can see that my uh, index finger and thumb are running along the septum because all scar is anchored to the septum, uh, either dorsally or ventrally or both. So it will be bet most easy to identify as you kind of uh, go up and down the length of the penis um, compressing uh, the, um, the septum. And then you can also go uh, 90 degrees to that to feel actual scar tissue within the septum. Uh, the penis here is measured on stretch. I use a ruler like this, push down on the fat pad to the pubis as best as I can, and then measure to the beginning of the corona. So this gentleman here is about 11 and a half centimeters, uh, not including uh, the uh, glands. <clears throat> here is the... Uh, Penis uh, in the erect state, you know, we're measuring with a goniometer. Uh, if the patient is not fully erect, I compress the, the penis at the base to try to enhance rigidity and then measure curvature. And, I, and you can see, we do our best to sort of align this, but you can see that the proximal end of that goniometer, we could move it one way or the other, which might account for another five or 10 degrees of difference. And so this is part of the inaccuracy that we currently have with measuring curvature. And I would tell you that photographs uh, um, and then trying to measure with photographs are equally and maybe even more um, inaccurate than uh, doing an actual measurement uh, in the office. Here's a gentleman with severe curve and you can see there's a little bit of a narrowing uh, there near the mid shaft and of course what that results in is a hinge effect so the lightest amount of pressure on the penis here will cause it to buckle at that point of indentation. And here's a, a very bad deformity uh, with severe curvature, uh, bad indentation, <clears throat> as well as a 90 degree torsion. And here's that same patient in the operating room, uh, degloved. You can see the rather severe indentation with various creases there as well. Uh, and um, again, the severe curvature. So we're gonna be focusing uh, this evening on uh, patients with inadequate rigidity in terms of how do we address them surgically um, with uh, uh, placement of a penile prosthesis. 
Uh, this comes from a surgical algorithm that we published now 21 years ago, uh, where uh, we suggested placement of a prosthesis first, and it, sometimes that's all you need to get uh, adequate straightening and correction of mild deformity, uh, including curvature and, and indentation. I don't re recommend the LGX uh, because I think it takes more of the shape of its container. It, um, it uh, has a lot more flexibility, so it doesn't, uh, I think, provide the rigidity that we can get with the CX uh, useful for modeling. So the next step would be uh, manual modeling as suggested by uh, Steve Wilson back in 1994 was his first publication. And if that uh, does not get the patient uh, functionally straight, which to me would be 30 degrees or less following modeling, uh, then I think uh, uh, mobilization of neurovascular bundle and then incision of the tunica albuginea, and invariably uh, the defect will be greater than two centimeters, then you're gonna have to graft that defect uh, so as to prevent uh, cicatrix contracture uh, of the incision that you've made there, uh, to prevent herniation of the prosthesis, and it also provides hemostatic control as well. Al Mori uh, described uh, uh, seven or eight years ago now uh, performing plication uh, prior to placement uh, of a prosthesis. Uh, I find this is not altogether predictable as to where to place those sutures. Uh, they can get tangled up and get in the way, so I uh, tend to use the al algorithm uh, that I've just gone through. <clears throat> So for patients who have both uh, drug refractory or present with ED uh, and Peyronie's disease, I think what you want to do is assess the severity of their erectile dysfunction, uh, especially in terms of their response to PD-5 inhibitors. If they uh, tell you they've already tried maximum doses of Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Stendra, et cetera, uh, and they're not getting uh, a uh, erection quality that would be, uh, be adequate for penetration, uh, then I think we can potentially move on with discussions at that point with placement of a prosthesis and straightening maneuvers. And in fact, I would suggest that you would consider placing a prosthesis even in the acute phase of Peyronie's disease, <clears throat> as this may um, uh, reduce uh, further um, risk of length loss uh, that can occur with time with Peyronie's disease. There is no evidence uh, in terms of the published literature now, my own experience, um, of increased infection or malfunction of prostheses when you treat patients with prosthesis uh, and various straightening maneuvers. Uh, and I think that if the patient has had substantial length loss, as many of them have, uh, and, they, and that is a concern for them, you could consider uh, doing some traction beforehand. Typically two to three months of daily traction may recover as much as one to two centimeters which you know, to these patients may be meaningful. So here's a patient uh, with uh, a rather severe dorsal curvature. The prosthesis is in place uh, and inflated. Uh, and so uh, we would wanna move ahead and consider modeling. <clears throat> and so with modeling, it requires a high pressure cylinder, again, a CX, not the LGX. Uh, and then um, place the prosthesis first, Historically, it had been suggested that you close the corporotomy so that the, uh, the cylinders would not herniate out through the corporotomies. I recommend that you don't close the corporotomies. You know, make a two centimeter corporotomy, get your cylinders in. Because if you do do added maneuvers, in particular incision and grafting, you may change the length of the intracorporal space uh, and therefore have to uh, change out the, uh, not so much the cylinders, but maybe add in rear tip extenders and so forth. Uh, once the prosthesis is fully rigid, you want to protect the pump uh, by applying uh, shotted uh, clamps to the tubing between the pump and the cylinders. And then you want to bend and hold, uh, as Dr. Wilson suggested, 60 to 90 seconds. Uh, I find this almost impossible. It results in a, sort of a what I call hand angina, uh, hand fatigue, uh, and um, uh, and it may be a, a little bit more uh, inaccurate. So uh, I'll show you in a moment uh, a device that we're working on that might even help with that. It's not yet available, but I think it's kind of an interesting uh, potential uh, adjunct that we can use uh, interoperatively. But you repeat that uh, as needed until you get satisfactory straightening um, or not, and then you move on. Uh, Dr. Wilson Delk reported this first in the uh, Journal of Urology uh, in 1994, and you can see they had a 4% urethral injury rate, and that was because of distal 
um, laceration of the urethra. Basically, the cylinders would usually pop out through the meatus uh, because of the, how the pressures were being applied. Uh, thankfully, uh, in all the years that uh, I've been doing uh, this maneuver, I've had one urethral injury, and that was because of uh, application of pressure uh, rather than, um, will, as will be shown in a moment, uh, along the shaft, it was actually being pushed, pushing in on the point of indentation, which basically forced the tips more distally and sure enough, popped right out quite readily. So here is how I would suggest you arrange your hands during the procedure. Again, the shod, shotted uh, clamps are on board. You've got, uh, in this case, I have my left hand uh, with index finger and thumb over the corporotomies <clears throat> and then grasping the shaft below the glands, not uh, compressing the tips of the uh, cylinders or, or the glands over the cylinders. And then bend acutely uh, in the direction opposite the curvature, but again, maintaining uh, the pressure over the corporotomies so the cylinders don't pop out uh, and maintaining the um, the uh, bend on there for at least uh, 60 to 90 seconds if you can. Now, this is what I was talking about before, the reshape device. Uh, this is a new device uh, to assist in intraoperative modeling. Uh, I think it can facilitate this process, uh, reduce uh, what I call the hangina uh, effect, uh, and control pressure just where you want to do it. Uh, it is a patented device and it is seeking uh, FDA clearance. Uh, I also think it may be something that can be used for post-operative residual curvature, and it may even be a tool uh, for modeling uh, instead of uh, using traction for patients even without prostheses. This is what it looks like. Uh, you have uh, the, the uh, yellow thing there is a delivery tool uh, that would be placed over the erect penis in the operating room. You slide down the sleeve, which um, has these metal bands within them that have a certain amount of resilience and malleability. You bend and it will keep it in that position for um, you know, a, um, a predetermined amount of time that you want. Uh, you would then slip it off and, and uh, be able to uh, carry on. So here's a patient that uh, did undergo uh, the um, modeling, uh, but still has uh, a greater than 45 uh, degree uh, curvature uh, dorsally. And we had not anticipated uh, in uh, that patient, this is a different one, in fact, uh, we had not anticipated uh, that um, he would need the uh, incision and grafting. And so we uh, had done a, a penoscrotal approach uh, and then to be able to uh, do the uh, uh, model, the um, additional maneuvers with incision and grafting, uh, we had to do a, a degloving procedure so that we could then elevate uh, Buck's fascia uh, off of the uh, point of maximum curvature. We do not have to elevate it extensively along the entire length. You want to limit it to just so that you'll be able to get uh, exposure to the area that you want to incise uh, and then cover appropriately with a graft. Uh, we mark that area uh, with a uh, pen, and you can see uh, we have a sort of a double Y or a modified H incision. And the purpose of that is so that as you get out laterally by using those Y extensions, you can correct uh, indentation deformities quite nicely. We incise uh, with the prosthesis uh, deflated, uh, and I use typically 20 watts of power uh, to go just through the tunica albuginea, try to spare uh, the cavernosal tissue if possible uh, over the prosthesis, and then reinflate, do a little modeling and uh, pop uh, any residual scar tissue. You must, by the way, make your incisions go across all the way to the contralateral side, even if you have a pure lateral curve, uh, you need to be able to um, disrupt that attachment of the uh, scar tissue to the tunic <clears throat> Otherwise, it will, it will not correct uh, the deformity. Uh, and that's both for uh, patients who are with or without a prosthesis if you're doing grafting maneuvers. And then once you have uh, the defect established, uh, you uh, apply a, a graft. My preferred graft now is uh, Tachacil. Several years ago, we experimented with a variety of grafts. Uh, historically, we used to use pericardium, which we would sew in. Uh, but we started using various adhesive patches, and we find the Tachacil probably works the best uh, over a prosthesis. It is not my preferred uh, grafting, by the way, for uh, correction of deformity without a prosthesis, though. 
In this case on the left, we have a tachosyl graft in place. Um, you can see that it's overlapping onto the tunic, uh, over the, the tunical defect, at least a half to one centimeter in all aspects of our, um, our defect. But in this other one on the right, it's a much larger uh, deformity uh, and, or much, sorry, a much larger defect. And there's a greater concern there in terms of support uh, and possible uh, herniation. Uh, and therefore uh, I elected to sew in uh, a, a larger pericardial graft. The Bux fascia is reapproximated. That provides both uh, vascular and structural support. I typically leave the prosthesis about 50% rigid uh, for a couple of weeks to allow that graft to heal over uh, the uh, sort of rounded out prosthesis um, in that first couple of weeks period of time. So we don't have it start healing in a constricted kind of manner. And then we have recurrent deformity. Specifically to the uh, CX700 prosthesis uh, for treatment of men with ED and with Peyronie's, uh, the cylinders, uh, I think, uh, provide, uh, 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 with a controlled ex ex uh, expansion of the CX cylinder, uh, work very nicely for the patient with a compromised uh, tunica who have Peyronie's disease, uh, because it um, provides, I think, uh, excellent uh, rigidity uh, in the um, uh, post-operative uh, state for uh, penetrative sexual activity, and I think it provides excellent rigidity uh, during that intraoperative modeling. Uh, the MS pump uh, provides uh, uh, ease of use for cycling device, both in terms of inflation and deflation. And also, I feel that the uh, prosthesis has a rather natural appearance in both the flaccid and direct appearance, uh, and in particular, I think the feel of the cylinders, the CX cylinders uh, in the flaccid state uh, feel quite natural. Uh, there's also uh, an 84% uh, published uh, overall patient satisfaction rate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get through the video. So here's the video uh, and I'm gonna do my best to make sure I don't mess it up here. See if I can get that activated. And I'm gonna talk over this video. So today's case uh, is uh, a 64 year old uh, overall healthy gentleman who actually came up to see me from Miami. Uh, he had Peyronie's disease for two years. <clears throat> he presented with an uncircumcised penis. He had a stretched penile length of 11 centimeters, pubis to corona and very poor elasticity. Uh, the duplex uh, ultrasound that we performed showed a 7 over 10 erection, uh, which he said was similar to what he experienced at home. Uh, he had, uh, with some pressure at the base, uh, at least a 35 degree left and 35 degree dorsal curvature. But importantly, he also had a long left indentation in the mid shaft uh, and a uh, hinge effect. He had noted that his erectile dysfunction had become worse over the last year and was not responding well uh, to PDE5 inhibitors. So we discussed the options uh, of um, placement of a prosthesis uh, with straightening maneuvers and likely requiring incision and grafting. Uh, so here's the patient uh, being uh, uh, prepared in the operating room. We typically do uh, a 10 minute uh, betadine uh, scrub with a chloroprep finish. They receive IV uh, antibiotics, including gentamicin uh, and um, vancomycin, which are administered before anesthesia. Uh, with the uh, PrEP, uh, we uh, will, once we're uh, done uh, cleaning them up, we'll also, at the beginning, I should say, uh, irrigate the urethra with uh, some gentamicin. Uh, we have more recently been using uh, a, a deep uh, perineal pudendal nerve block with 20 cc's of 0.5% uh, rapivacaine without epinephrine. Uh, this has uh, markedly reduced the narcotic use that the anesthesiologists uh, uh, find and I think helps with post-operative uh, anesthesia as well. Here you can see we've placed the Ioband dressing uh, and um, we measure the penis uh, intraoperatively uh, because usually in the OR we can find that we might get an extra half a centimeter of length because now they're under anesthesia, we can really crank away on, on the penis. 
We'll also add additional block with uh, another 20 cc's of 0.5% uh, rapivacaine as a dorsal penile block. And we are also injecting uh, uh, 60 cc's of a 50-50 mixture of 1% lidocaine uh, mixed with uh, uh, sterile saline. <clears throat> this I think provides three benefits. One is it's a little bit more local anesthesia. Second, I think the fluid in there facilitates some mechanical dilation. And lastly, if they can hold the fluid that you're um, instilling, you can get an idea of the nature of their deformity. Uh, we then uh, will mark the penis um, uh, with uh, a dorsal and ventral longitudinal mark so that we can do realignment of our circumcising incision uh, at the end of surgery. If the, um, I'll just say a moment, if, if the circumcision site is nice uh, and distal, uh, I would say somewhere in the one to two centimeter range from the corona, you can go through that old site. But if it is a much more proximal <clears throat> old incision site for their circumcision, uh, if they are circumcised, um, then um, uh, I suggest you go more uh, distally to, you know, again, one and a half to two centimeters uh, uh, proximal to the corona to reduce uh, the postoperative edema that can happen, uh, again, distal to your circumcising incision. Here, the incision is being made down through skin uh, and dartos. Uh, and that allows ready uh, degloving of the penis manually, um, which will pull down all the way to the very base. We elevate Buck's fascia off the proximal ventral lateral uh, corpora, and we can get all the way down to the uh, bulbospongiosis muscles. So there's no compromise in being able to get access to the more proximal corpora. And then we'll place uh, a pair of 2-0 uh, PDS uh, sutures. And this uh, is an area where we'll do our corporate. You see, we get a little extra exposure with a couple uh, thyroid retractors. <clears throat> we make about a two centimeter, one and a half to two centimeter corporotomy. He didn't have much bleeding associated with his ED. And then I like to dilate up to 14 millimeters proximally with the Brooks dilators, typically a single throw, uh, and then distally to 12 millimeters. You can see we have a little difficulty dilating distally because that scarring there where he had his indentation uh, was uh, also uh, involved, uh, I think some of the tunic, uh, sorry, the cavernosal tissue. We measure both proximally and distally, uh, and I measured to a single point, uh, and I use the maximum length. If indeed, so I was not supposed to do that. Sorry about that. I'm gonna see if I can get us back to where we were. There we go. Um, if um, uh, you're uh, at a, uh, a half a centimeter point, in other words, uh, if it was uh, 21.5 centimeters, uh, I would usually add, particularly in the Peyronie's case, another half a centimeter, particularly if you think that you're gonna be doing some uh, incision and grafting, because again, you're likely to gain a little bit of intracavernosal uh, length. Throughout the operation, we use copious antibiotic irrigation. I have for years been using rifampin, but I also use gentamicin. And if the patient's diabetic, I use a amphotericin uh, irrigation uh, because a, a fungal infection is a disaster. Uh, we change, all surgical personnel change uh, their gloves prior to handling the prosthesis. <clears throat> and then we prepare it in the usual fashion by evacuating the air, substituting saline, and then removing the saline where necessary. Uh, this fellow had a, had a 22 centimeter length, so we ended up uh, putting uh, a 21 uh, cel uh, centimeter cylinders with a one centimeter rear tip extender and a uh, standard, um, I think we had, a, a, it was, I think it was a 100 cc uh, spherical reservoir there, which uh, again, you can see uh, we're preparing on the back table. I tend to like to repair my own. Uh, we then place the cylinders in with the aid of the furlough inserter. Uh, important point here is that you can see that my fingers are sort of pulling back on the glands in a more ventral fashion to present the dorsal lateral aspect of the gland so that we can drive the need needle out uh, uh, through that uh, ideal spot. During the placement of the cylinders, we irrigate uh, with antibiotics because we believe that uh, we can reduce static electricity and uh, adherence of bacteria that may be in the vicinity to the uh, prosthesis. 
Some people like to place their cylinders proximally first. I place them distally and then uh, place them uh, down with the aid of uh, the butt end of a uh, DeBakey uh, forceps. And then we'll perform a surrogate reservoir test. I always perform a surrogate reservoir test, even in patients without Peyronie's disease. It ensures that the, the cylinders are placed properly, that there's no crossover, that you have nice uh, symmetrical distal placement in the, in the glands. <clears throat> and you can see here, we're identifying the indentation. We're measuring the curvature um, in the erect state with the prosthesis in place. Sometimes you get a much worse uh, deformity because now we have a fully rigid penis that you might not get uh, with somebody uh, with ED during your duplex ultrasound. So we applied our uh, shotted clamps. You can see the fingers are uh, compressing the uh, corporotomy sites. And now with the, with the hand below the level of the glands, we are bending in the direction opposite to the curvature. And then we're going to hold it in that position as best we can until the hangina gets to be too much and you have to let go. Um, I'm happy to have uh, wonderful new fellows uh, every year who um, have, uh, I think, uh, stronger hands than I do and can, uh, and can maintain the, the um, tension on the penis. But it's very important that you do this in a fashion, as is shown here, where you're not applying forces directly on that point of indentation, because that will tend to result in distal um, pushing of the cylinders, which can result in the uh, um, extrusion. Uh, so we can see basically this plaque kind of laughed at our, um, our, uh, our, uh, our modeling. And so we said, let's uh, proceed with uh, elevation of our Buck's fascia in the area of maximum uh, deformity. Uh, and we make a pair of longitudinal incisions, one on each side of the urethral ridge, and then very carefully elevate uh, Buck's fascia right off the surface of the tunic. Uh, this can be oftentimes done with just some simple spreading maneuvers uh, when we go uh, medially towards the urethra. But as we go dorsal laterally, uh, we want to be very careful that we don't injure. You notice I'm using my fingers to hold Buck's fascia rather than uh, instruments because I think they're less likely to crush or injure the nerves. Uh, and once we have it fully um, elevated, uh, we put, apply a Vessi loop. Uh, and again, that's done on both sides. And we are now marking the area of maximum curvature and indentation with this. We take the innards out of a, a pen here uh, and hold it with a, uh, a clamp and then um, draw our uh, double Y uh, type of um, uh, incision point. And once this is uh, marked, um, we'll prepare to incise it. I typically will do this with the penis now fully inflated, the prosthesis fully inflated and rigid, but I'll deflate uh, during uh, the um, uh, incision with, with cautery, which we do at about 20 uh, watts or less. Again, my goal is just to go through the uh, tunical tissues as shown here. Again, this is being done on both sides of the penis. And we now reinflate the prosthesis and perform some modeling uh, to uh, get our straightening. And if we have to do additional incision in the uh, tunic to uh, correct indentation or get more uh, correct uh, uh, straightening, we can do that. Here we have the penis now fully inflated. Uh, we're using our uh, ruler uh, to measure the uh, uh, dimensions of our defect, both transversely and longitudinally. Uh, again, we prefer uh, Tachacil. I tend to uh, change gloves at this point. And again, measure uh, generously, uh, make it at least a centimeter longer uh, in length and, and width uh, than the, the maximum dimensions of your defects so that you can have good overlap of the uh, graft over your tunical defect. I do a little trimming just to make sure it will fit nicely uh, underneath. And then we draw the now moistened um, uh, Tachacil uh, over the defect uh, and basically almost like smear it in place uh, over a defect so that we can get good adherence uh, to, the, uh, to the tunic and trim as you need to. Buck's fascia is then closed in a running fashion with fluorochromic. Again, that provides both structural and vascular support. This is done in a in a running fashion, just again, it will also help with some hemostasis, needless to say. 
Now this patient um, had uh, somewhat of a floppy glands uh, dorsally. Uh, and um, I think we've come to realize that a lot of men with uh, ED might have um, a difficulty in being able to get uh, full dilation up into the most distal aspect of the uh, corpora, but there may also be some proximal, um, almost like migration of the cylinders out of the glands that might result in, uh, in poor support. Uh, and so in this case, uh, he was flopping um, dorsally, and therefore we wanted to do a glands pexy uh, and bring the glands and secure it more ventrally. So we established a plane, <clears throat> and I'm using these Snowden pincer uh, scissors, uh, which are very nice uh, uh, dissecting scissors. And we're going making a plane between or deep to dartos, but superficial to bucks. And as you can see, uh, we are going up into the, uh, the more, uh, uh, just uh, proximal to the, uh, to the corona so that we'll be able to grasp some of the internal tissues here. We do this with a 4-0 monocryl on a TF uh, needle. And that TF needle is important because it's a tiny needle, it's strong, and you can grasp that tissue through that tiny uh, hole that you've made there. And of course, the prosthesis is fully deflated now. I pinch and grasp some of the tunica and uh, the uh, dartos. Uh, and then tie down our sutures as needed. Typically, uh, two or three of these uh, may be all you need to get the kind of uh, uh, support that you need uh, to uh, scar down that uh, area and, and have it um, uh, be properly supported uh, postoperatively. Uh, we're now closing our corporotomies. We do this in a running fashion with uh, two OPDS and then use the existing stay sutures to uh, reinforce that closure. And then we um, place our pump. Uh, typically what I'll do uh, is uh, make a plane along the uh, left or right lateral aspect of the shaft going down proximally into the scrotum. And then with my finger, force my way through the dartos and make a little subdartos pouch. Uh, we place uh, a baby deaver uh, in that uh, space, uh, which you'll see in a moment, there it is. And then, uh, 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 push the um, pump down into that space and make sure that it's well secured uh, and well into the inferior. And I try to make it inferior anterior aspect uh, of the scrotum. You know, the only part of the prosthesis the patient has to manipulate is the pump. So you really want that pump to be convenient, out of the way, uh, and uh, um, easy to operate. Now, all this surgery has been done uh, without a catheter. Uh, we have the patient void before coming into the operating room, but now we wanna empty the bladder so that we won't injure it during the uh, placement uh, of our reservoir. Uh, we can, again, do all this through this um, uh, subcoronal uh, circumcising incision. Uh, we identify um, with the uh, index finger here, the uh, left external in, uh, uh, inguinal ring, uh, the uh, baby diva there is going to help uh, uh, identify that as well. And then using the Jorgensen scissors, which will be coming in here in a moment, which are the curved scissors, which have, I'm not sure if you can appreciate that, but they have almost a 90 degree downward bend. These are used typically for uh, deep pelvic or uh, high in the chest <clears throat> type of surgery, Jorgensen scissors with a J. Uh, and I've uh, published a paper on this years ago showing that you can more or less get into the space eretzius more safely, I think, with this approach because that curvature uh, will make it so the tips are directed away from bladder, bowel, and vessels. Uh, and uh, I have used this now with about a 90% success rate, even in patients who have had radical uh, prostatectomy uh, uh, of any sort, um, with, where that space may be um, uh, essentially obliterated, but we can almost always find that space and place the reservoir into that um, reconstituted space or retsis. So here we are putting the scissors in, we're following the pubic bone, and then once you get beyond it, you lift up towards the ceiling, spread, remove, and identify your little hole. You can digitally dilate the space or retsis quite readily now. And then we want to place uh, a long nose nasal speculum into the space so that we can irrigate 
and then subsequently place our reservoir. The reservoir is placed using uh, a sponge stick clamp uh, that's atraumatic, uh, and then we'll fill uh, to the appropriate um, uh, volume uh, the reservoir, trim our tubing uh, using the Quick Connect system provided by the manufacturer. The system is now placed uh, in, um, in continuity. We uh, cycle the device, make sure it's operating properly. And I always will place a drain in these cases because there's too much opportunity, obviously, for bleeding with the grafting at all. And then closure will be performed uh, in two layers, first approximating dartos with interrupted 4 monocryl and then skin with interrupted 4 chromic. I find that this ends up having a safer, uh, more secure closure uh, and doesn't tend to heap up. We can see that we've got a nice, nicely straightened penis now with an excellent uh, rigidity. Again, I leave it about 50% inflated um, and the catheter will stay as will the, um, uh, as will the uh, drain. Um, we apply a mummy wrap uh, and that mummy wrap typically stays on for three days. I do these procedures uh, typically uh, in our surgery center um, and uh, we'll observe them for a couple hours afterwards to make sure there's no evidence of a duskiness. Uh, I think if there are, if I do plan to do this on, on uh, patients who have a lot of comorbidities, I might be more comfortable keeping them in the hospital overnight for observation uh, because we want to make sure there is no distal uh, ischemia, pardon me, going on. So a couple of published papers uh, that came out a while ago. Here's one from our institution back in 2010. We had 90 consecutive patients with PD and ED that did not respond to PD-5 inhibitors. Um, we had a mean curvature of 53 degrees, uh, but you can see there's one there was zero uh, and the other uh, up to 105. We followed them for a mean of about four years, but up to 14 years overall. 4% actually had um, uh, satisfactory uh, uh, correction of their minor deformity by just placing a prosthesis. And interestingly, then we had 79% where we did modeling only and got what we thought was satisfactory correction of curvature. 16% needed incision and, uh, and or grafting, and we only had one uh, infection. Mechanical failure rate over that entire period of time was 7%. And we sent out a questionnaire and we found that overall satisfaction was 84%. But what was particularly interesting, and this is kind of what we learned from our studies, you know, uh, was that we had only a 73% uh, curvature correction satisfaction. Uh, and so what this told us was that we needed to discuss with our patients preoperatively what were their goals? What was their tolerance for uh, residual curvature? Um, I now ask patients, do you want to be arrow straight? Because if they do, uh, it's likely we're going to need to take a subcoronal approach and do in, in, and plan to do incision and grafting. Uh, but if they could tolerate what I call functional straightness of 30 degrees or less after modeling, uh, we might not need to do anything more. And indeed, maybe with the use of the device, they may have progressive improvement of their deformity to some degree. Historically, it's been suggested that may take as much as a year, but we've learned again from our patients that stabilization of whatever deformity they have will occur within the first three to four months, and they don't tend to get uh, progressive improvement uh, over, over time. So it's that acute period there where I think we're gonna get the best uh, results. Another paper by Eric Chung, who was with Jerry Brock when he was a, a fellow years ago, he looked at 135 consecutive men with Peyronie's and had placement of prosthesis. They followed them for a mean of 45 months uh, and they had similar degrees of curvature. They had 88 or CX700, another 50 with Titan devices. And they did a really a device survival analysis. And they found with their five year Kaplan Meyer assessment that there was really no difference between the, the two devices and that about 80% were greatly satisfied with their outcome. A study that we recently published looked at men over the age of 65. You know, I was always taught that, geez, if they're over 55, 60 and they have Peyronie's, put a prosthesis in them, forget about it, you know, straighten them out thereafter because they're gonna have ED. 
Well, you know, there are a lot of men who are over 65 that have good erections and may not need a prosthesis. And so we used our previously published uh, algorithm in 1997, and we used the criteria to um, determine how did pe people do if they were over 65. We had 86 of these men, 25 of them underwent a tunic application, 22 uh, underwent uh, a PEG uh, procedure with grafting without a prosthesis, and 39 had prosthesis and straightening maneuvers. And you can look down under penetrative sex postoperatively, 92% of the men with a TAP uh, were engaging in penetrative sex and 95% in both the PEG uh, with, with and without uh, prosthesis were engaged in uh, penetrative sexual activity. So it does appear that if you properly counsel your patients and you properly select them, regardless of their age, if they have good erections, they may not need a prosthesis, but if they are not experiencing good erections preoperatively, it's probably best uh, to move forward with placement of a prosthesis and straightening maneuvers. And just a word about what I think is the ultimate uh, frontier in penile prosthetic surgery, and that is length restoration. I'm not talking about lengthening here. I'm talking about restoration of length that's lost uh, with patients in Peyronie's. There are a variety of techniques uh, that uh, have been recommended uh, over the years. Uh, they get quite complicated and they increase uh, risk substantially. And there is no guarantee uh, as to what type of length you might be able to recover. I've done this in patients and spent three hours in there and gained a half a centimeter, but I've also gained up to four centimeters. But I tell patients preoperatively uh, that I cannot predict that. It's all about the relative laxity uh, of the neurovascular bundle once it's released from its attachments uh, to the penis. Uh, if there are questions about that, we can certainly address uh, that more during our Q&A uh, uh, portion of our um, session here. So just in conclusion, um, the pre-op assessment I think is critical. Uh, we want to understand their erectile capacity, we want to understand their deformity, and we want to uh, measure uh, their deformity and their length. Informed consent uh, is obviously critical, and patient selection is the key to, I think, getting the best possible outcomes uh, with patients. I think we have to set their expectations carefully. I think an IPP is uh, certainly reasonable when the patient has PDE5 uh, inhibitor refractory erectile dysfunction. And if they have pre-existing ED, I think you can move ahead with placement of a prosthesis even in the acute phase, because you may save them a few more centimeters of length loss as that disease process is carrying on over time. I think modeling is appropriate when the curvature is less than 60 degrees and you have no indent or just a mild indentation. I think you can place the IPP through an infrapubic or a penoscrotal uh, approach. But if the patient has severe curvature, with or without uh, an hourglass deformity, I think you should consider making a subcoronal incision for your uh, full exposure and be able to place the entire prosthesis and correct the deformity with uh, incision and grafting through that subcoronal approach. And so that's all I have for us tonight as far as uh, this discussion. And I think it's Time for us to consider some questions, if there are any. Yeah, we did get a couple that came through the chat. Um, so I'll start just sort of in order that they came in. Um, the first one is, at what level of deformity do you recommend IPP with grafting versus grafting alone for men with adequate erectile function? Well, if they have adequate erectile function, um, they don't need a prosthesis in, in the first place. Uh, and so we determine that from their history uh, and from what we see during the duplex ultrasound. Um, uh, we have found, and we've published on this uh, with several papers now, with over 250 patients analyzed, that the best predictor for who is going to not have or will have postoperative erectile dysfunction if you do a grafting procedure the only parameter that we found that was a, that kind of predictor was preoperative erectile status. So size of the defect, of the direction or severity of curvature, whether they were calcified or not, their age, none of this mattered. What mattered is, Charlie, if your penis were straight right now, would you be able to have 
sexual activity, uh, you know, successful penetrative sexual activity? If the answer is a resounding yes, I think they're a candidate to do uh, a, what I call a PEG, uh, which is partial excision and grafting without a prosthesis. If the answer is, well, it's not so good, and even if I take uh, 100 milligrams Viagra, 20 milligrams Cialis, I'm still not getting the rigidity I think I need or I'm not maintaining it, I think it's time to talk to that gentleman about placing a prosthesis. So it's not about the deformity, it's all about the rigidity. Um, the next question is, um, let me see here. Do you maximally inflate prior to penile modeling? Do I maximally inflate? Absolutely. I mean, I, I put make them as fully hard as I can because that's going to optimize our ability to do the modeling process. Uh, and again, that the modeling is, has to be done very carefully and deliberately. Uh, Paul Perito describes a sort of a chicken choke technique where he kind of compresses the uh, meatus to, again, uh, reduce the likelihood of distal uh, migration. I find that my technique works well. I like to keep my hands away from the meatus because, you know, by definition, it's, it's dirty. Um, so I'll work uh, down on the shaft of the penis and apply my forces there. Uh, which is kind of what this uh, kind of reshape uh, uh, design is going to do, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, secure that area where you want to apply your uh, your uh, traction forces to uh, modeling forces to uh, uh, correct the curvature. Okay, awesome. Um, and then the next question is: What is your surgical approach in men with planned incision and/or grafting at the time of IPP placement? Sorry, say that once again. What is my planned? What is your surgical approach in men with planned incision and grafting at the time of IPP placement? Well, uh, as shown in this uh, video, uh, if I know that I'm going to need to do incision and grafting. Uh, my approach is a, a single incision, uh, subcoronal incision to deglove the penis all the way down to the base. Uh, I think we can readily and easily place the uh, prosthesis uh, through that and get a good proximal uh, corporotomy um, exit site uh, for the uh, tubing. Um, I think the only concern that we should have about the subcoronal approach has been the concern about uh, distal um, ischemic uh, injury. You know, clearly here we are uh, uh, elevating the neurovascular bundle uh, that provides some of the blood supply uh, to the glands. Uh, so we want to certainly minimize um, any dissection around the urethra because that's going to be carrying um, additional uh, re, you know, blood flow uh, and support uh, to, to the glands. Uh, and so that's why uh, in those patients that I uh, have some concerns about. They're diabetic, they have coronary disease. Uh, they may have already some uh, more severe vascular disease, which a lot of these patients with ED will have. Uh, but if they're quite complicated in that regard, multi, uh, uh, you know, vascular paths, I would say that maybe those patients should be done uh, in the hospital so we can keep on under observation. Because if in the, in the, you know, over the course of the evening, they start getting a dusky glance, which thankfully I've not had, occur in my patients, but if they do, it's time to get that prosthesis out right away. Okay, great. And just two more questions. Um, so the next one is, when booking these cases in the OR, while planning for an IPP with PIG, how long do you schedule these cases for? Um, I usually can get this done in about uh, an hour and a half, uh, but uh, I, I'd say if you're not doing these on a regular basis, uh, you're not in there for speed. Uh, you're in there for accuracy. So uh, I would say plan for two, two and a half hours uh, and you know, take your time. But uh, you know, it, like all things, if you start doing them enough, you become more familiar and you know, one step leads to the next and you can get it done pretty promptly. Blood loss is minimal. I've never had to transfuse anybody. Uh, and with the blocks that we're using now, patients tend to do quite nicely in the at least early post-operative phase. Um, Sometimes having the prosthesis uh, that partially inflated for that two weeks can be difficult for concealment, uh, but we do get the catheter out 24 hours after surgery. Typically, the, the, red, the um, drain can come out uh, the next day as well. 
Okay, we had a couple more questions come in actually. So um, the next one is, do you ever do penile plication at the time of IPP for mild residual curve post-modeling? Uh, I don't. Um, I know other people have. Uh, I think the concern there is, you know, if you've got the prosthesis in uh, and now you want to do some modeling, I'm sorry, you want to do some uh, plication, you're placing sutures uh, through the tunica albuginea and have a much higher risk, I think, of bagging uh, the, uh, the prosthesis, particularly with these bigger uh, needles that you need to use um, and that you need to get a good chunk uh, full thickness uh, tunic to be able to accomplish that plication. So I think uh, Al Mori's uh, pre-placement of, of uh, 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 sutures uh, for um, uh, plication makes better sense in terms of safety, uh, but I also find that, um, find that a bit um, uh, less than optimum in terms of what I can get with the techniques that we've shown here tonight. Okay, and now just two more questions. Um, how do you feel about urethral elevation for ventral curvature in vascular paths? Well, if uh, I had a gentleman recently who, who had a 70 degree ventral curve, uh, and in general, uh, I have uh, stated that even in the men who have good erections and have a severe ventral curve that would require grafting, uh, that the risk of ED is at least 50%. Uh, and we're not talking just about uh, erectile dysfunction, we're talking about impotence. Uh, they uh, often have usually severe uh, venous leakage. So if you're considering treating a man with severe ventral curvature, I think they need a prosthesis number one. Uh, subsequently, uh, you want to elevate, you have to elevate the urethra if you want to do incision and grafting as we did in this other gentleman, uh, I think it was last week. But in that case, you're not mobilizing at all uh, the dorsal neurovascular bundle. So you're minimizing the injury to that uh, source of blood uh, to the glands. Uh, and I think uh, you'd also want to be very careful uh, how you're elevating uh, the uh, urethra to minimize injury to the vascular supply there. Uh, and again, a, a, just a, enough filling of the prosthesis to round it out. It doesn't have to be fully rigid, uh, just round it out and use no bigger than a 14 French catheter uh, to keep the pressures off the walls of the urethra, which uh, again, I think are all things that will diminish the likelihood of more ischemia. That's good. That's a complicated question, and hopefully, I've addressed it right. Um, thank you. Um, and the last question I know we're slightly over time, but last question is In your experience, do you find it more difficult with neurovascular bundle dissection in patients who have failed Xyoflex? Do you have any tips or tricks? Yeah, I, I have found uh, we published a report early, and then I think Wayne Hellstrom and uh, his group. Uh, 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 reported on some more. And then uh, my previous fellow, Peter Bayich, who's now at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, looked at, um, I think we had over 60 men or close to 70 men who had had Xyaflex and subsequently needed uh, 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 correction of their deformity. Um, and some of them needed a grafting procedure. We have found that the plane between the Buck's fascia and tunic is oftentimes more difficult to elevate than um, uh, then if uh, Zyflex has not been used, um, but uh, we've been able to accomplish it. Uh, we've not had any uh, added uh, higher risk of uh, subsequent um, uh, neuropathy or uh, sensory loss. Um, uh, you know, th that neurovascular bundle, I think, is, is quite uh, resilient. Uh, and uh, the patients tend to recover reasonably quickly, but I always tell them it may be a six to 12 month process. Um, but I would say the, 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 the trick is starting where it's easy. Uh, my boss uh, that was sort of my mentor to surgery was a guy named Ben Giddis, 
uh, trained me back at the Brigham Hospital a thousand years ago now. And he would always say, Larry, circle the quarry. You always come from the easy part and move to the center where it's maybe more difficult and very slowly work your way through the area of greater difficulty in terms of dissection. And I think that seems to help uh, with that mobilization. Okay, great. Well, that's all the questions we got through all of them. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, and just wanted to thank you again for this great webinar. It was really great content. And thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Boston Scientific. Good evening. All right. Have a great night.